So what it says is the services provided by supported living require that they're offering meaningful choice and control in their daily lives. That means I'm going to get to choose what I want to do today. I'm going to choose if I want to go shopping or not. Even if I said I wanted to go shopping, I might have changed my mind. And people shouldn't be coerced to have to do things like you know, if you have small children, if you tell them you're going to do something, they're not going to let you off the hook, right? Unless you offer something better. <laughs> Excuse me. So we want to allow people the same freedoms that you and I enjoy. And that is the ability to choose how they want to spend their days, who they want to spend them with. And now we're going to talk about choice because choice is a big word in supported living. That doesn't mean we're going to just cut you loose and you choose to do whatever you want, whenever you want, whether it's harmful to you or not. No, there's always the health and safety piece of person-centered approaches. So don't panic yet. All right. They also should be able to choose who they live with. A lot of supported living agencies will help someone find a roommate. That hair is just going crazy. Um, and you, as the person receiving services, should decide whether or not that's the person you want as a roommate. So it shouldn't be, well, this is going to be your roommate. It should be, would you like to meet this person and see if it's a good fit for you? And you can always change your mind. So here's what we typically see in services. And, you know, it's not custom to what the person wants in their life. And this is typically the offering. I've set up a structure for you, sorry, and you're gonna choose from our way. It needs to be developed with the person what way do you want it? And it's going to give you a lot of options like what to wear. And you might think this was an accidental put together. Not. It was repeated later. This is my beautiful daughter, Lauren, who is super creative and loves color, as you can see. And so, you know, we're going to pick our battles right? We're going to pick our battles. Now, if she was going to a job interview, I would probably say, hey, how about we just put plain leggings on instead of the stars with the flower skirt and the cherry shoes? So it's all balance. We're going to balance things. So the other things that need to have happen in supported living and that may be included in the service depending on how the agency has written their business plan that we call a service design. Assistance with selecting and moving into a home. It's very difficult, but if you don't have family, you really have to rely on the system to support you in doing this. Choosing who's going to support you. I already talked about housemates. It could be a person with um, a need for supported living services as well, or it could be one of the staff, um, getting all the furniture and things that you need. And then assisting with the activities of daily living, as it's called, um, and making sure that, you know, there's shampoo in the shower before they get in there. A you know, being able to respond to emergency situations and then assisting that person to be a part and a contributing member of the community um, and assist them with finances as well. And then there's other stuff, right? So the supports also are required to foster and nurture relationships. And that's not with the staff, that's with other people in that person's life. Perhaps there's a community of faith and this person wants to go to church. It's gonna be up to the supported living staff to make sure that person is able to go to church. It might be full community membership. And that means, you know, I am not just 
in the community. I am part of the community. People know me where I go. The people at Starbucks know my name and they know my drink. Um, those are important things for us as human beings. And they're there to support working toward the goals and the visions for the person. We're going to talk about vision in a few minutes. And again, there's nothing happier than Lauren with um, barbecue chicken and French fries at a San Jose Giants game with her boyfriend. Her staff takes him, her there and her boyfriend. And that's part of the job. Of course, it's been a lot different since COVID, uh, but we hope to get back to normal in the future. I'm not going to say when because we keep getting surprised by COVID, but you know, we are going to return to life and as we knew it before eventually, just like they did in the early 1900s after the Spanish flu. And we want to make sure that the staff who support them and the agency who is funded by the regional center is complying with these standards that are in supported living. So one of the things that we do when we're looking at relationships and fostering relationships is we think about the staff as being the person's friend. So Dave Hinsberger, an amazing educator, was a big guy in the behavioral services industry. And he finally kind of just went, this has to change. So I'm going to show this video about the people who would be supporting your child and friendship. Probably one of the most controversial things that I wrote a number of years ago that got people very angry at me, um, and still there are many people who are still very angry, was when I proposed that staff understand the nature of their role with people with disabilities, um, and that there needs to be boundaries that come with that role, okay? So let's just make that clear. We are not friends, and we are not family. I've seen people who've come in um, to work in a, in a place with people with disabilities and they're, they're, they go on about, oh, we're all friends and you're my best friend and I love doing things with you, you're my friend, you're my friend, you're my friend, and, and they, they violate all sorts of boundaries in terms of you know, what they share with people and so forth. What happens when they leave? You see this in just devastation. I mean, just devastation. You've come into people's lives. You've misrepresented who you are. You misrepresent the feelings that you have. You misrepresent all of that. And you, in, and you purposefully engage and solicit um, real affectionate feelings from someone, okay? Um, and then you cut and you leave and take another job. Okay, so we have people with disabilities who are simply devastated, simply devastated by that. And you know, um, it's sometimes very hard uh, for the staff that come in next, okay, because we've got people who are grieving. And you know, if you take a look at the nature of the field, um, I don't know when staff turnover is in other places, but staff turnover in Toronto is Thursday, okay? So there's a lot of people who come in. So we have people with disabilities who are going through this situation of people coming in, they lie, they leave, 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 okay? So we have people with disabilities who are spending a lifetime of mourning and a lifetime of grieving because they believed that this was a friendship. And they believed that this was reciprocal. And they believed this because you said that. You said that in what you called yourself. You said that in what re how you represented yourself. So we use the lie of friendship to cover up the social isolation of somebody with a disability. And the moment that we don't do that anymore, we see that social isolation in stark, stark, ways and then all of a sudden people say oh my god oh my god well well you know what if we're not friends and then they don't have any friends at all well, you know, what are we supposed to do 
Well, that's where you start, isn't it? So I just think that is so important when people are that close to someone providing supported living services and they truly believe that they're friends um, to the person who's receiving the services, but it's really important to help our individuals, our sons and daughters understand that they're staff, they're, they're workers, they're helpers. And, you know, your friends are the people who are there without a paycheck. You're not going to say that to your child, but your mindset should be, this is somebody who's here to help us. I shouldn't tell you should be because you all have a right to your own opinion. Um, but I, this shows you the impact of the possible uh, consequence of letting our children believe that staff are friends. So I think it's really an important piece for us to look at. And um, when we are setting up systems for our sons and daughters. So I've got a few more slides to get more deeply into the supported living services themselves. So here's the person in the center. And you may have heard about the circles of support, which are can, can be a challenge to build, but especially during a pandemic, it's even harder. But the person in the center should have a meaningful, good life with happiness in it. Right to pursue happiness is a constitutional right, whether you have a disability or no disability. I'm gonna fix my share. It looks like you're not seeing what I'm seeing. There we go. How we do that is we provide support staff that are trained, who know who our son and daughter is, who knows what's important to them, who knows what works for them in the way of supports. Community, that they have a community presence, even though they're masked right now. I often wonder, are people gonna recognize me without my mask once the pandemic's over? And then family and friends. So that outside circle is how we get to that meaningful, good life with a component of happiness. Does that mean happiness is ever present? No, it's not ever present in any of our lives, but we have the right to pursue that. And people with disabilities should have the same constitutional and human rights that the rest of us do. Supported living is one of the ways that really offers you that possibility. Somebody asked a question and it was, what about people who have aggressive and challenging behaviors? Yes, they can have supported living. And let's say they need two staff because of those behavioral support needs. You can get a health and safety waiver to be able to provide that. My thought and with my daughter, because she was one of those individuals that you described when you asked the question, um, things got better as time went on. But she was somebody who had a lot of behavioral challenges and we had a behaviorist come in to work with the staff to help them understand her better, how to support her without triggering her. There's so many things that we can do to help reduce some of those, um, if it's truly behavior and not neurological, those more aggressive states that people can find themselves in. Um, it's a real challenge sometimes, but you know, us with our children, we create these patterns that you are really hard to correct when you're living with them or how to, how to shift and change and change the dynamic. And it takes time, but it's very possible. It's really changed my daughters and my relationship as we became person-centered in how we supported her because she was just mad all the time. You know, we were trying to control her all the time. I'd be mad if somebody was doing that to me too. So what we need to learn to do person-centered supported living services, and you may have seen some of these slides from me before, is identifying what's important to someone. 
How we get to important two are these methods. Giving someone status and control over their lives. Relationships, people, things, places. These are the ways that we help to get what's important to us. And we need to listen to people based on their behavior if it's different than the words. We always pay attention to the behavior because we have taught people to be compliant and they may say something, but they don't really mean it. And then we get a behavior and we don't understand why are they acting that way? Well, because you taught them to say what you wanted them to say, but they didn't really feel that way. And so when they actually have to do something or go somewhere, they're already mad. And so anything else that can trigger that is going to make it worse. When we're looking at important for people, that's the balance to important too, is we have to maintain their safety, right? They're, you know, crossing the street. We're not going to say, oh, it's your choice to cross the street when cars are coming. That. You know, that's just kind of anti common sense, right? So we have to balance the things that are important to someone with what's important for and keeping them safe, living free from fear. Being in fear of continuous threats of not being able to do something, taking away the things that are important to you as a way to get you to do what I want you to do, that's living in fear. You know, what if somebody said, I'm going to take your phone away because, you know, you haven't been doing a great job of keeping the kitchen clean. You wouldn't be very happy about that. And, you know, if somebody did that, you might well be really ticked off and uh, not very much fun to be around. And then health, of course, we have to make sure that people are healthy. They're getting the nutrition. They're getting preventative and wellness care. They're getting treatment when they need it. But that means we have to learn how they communicate to us something is wrong. I'm going to tell you a very quick story because this is really important. I was observing in an agency and we were doing a planning process. And this gentleman was about my age and he was the client. And we're both gray hairs, right? And so... I've already been informed that he really liked women. And so I'm sitting kind of across where I can see him. I can make eye contact with him. And he kept looking at me. And I thought, well, maybe he's curious about why I'm here. So, you know, we took the time to explain why I'm here. And then he started cupping his cheek. And what do you think that could have meant? Let me ask the PHP staff to share because I know that the rest of you can't use chat to everyone. But what do you think this might have meant? He's got a toothache. <laughs> indeed. He did indeed. Oh. I kind of thought at first maybe he's kind of being flirty, right? Because he likes women. We're about the same age. And I did make some effort to look nice that day. Well, he did that for quite some time, for like maybe an hour of our meeting. And it was a two and a half hour meeting. And I finally said, can anyone tell me what this means? And they said, oh, he has dental pain. I guess it's a chronic issue for this guy. And I said, well, has his pain been treated yet today so that he can fully participate? And they said, well, we don't keep medicine here at the day program. So I dug in my purse, I pulled out that Tylenol and I said, his pain really needs to be addressed before we go on. So we, you know, looked at the pills, we did a Google so that we could make sure it was Tylenol and his sister gave us permission to let him have two Tylenol. Within an hour, he wasn't doing that anymore. And he was more engaged and he was contributing to this session. They had been with this man for 15 years, providing residential care and day services. Now, they 
wonder why we as families worry. And then you hear a story like that and you go, well, no wonder we worry. So it's up to us to make sure that, you know, the needs are being met. And oftentimes what happens when we allow our child to go live in a residential care facility or in supported living, they really want to do their thing because they think they know what they're doing, but they don't know our child. So it's up to us to make sure that they know our child well. And we're going to talk about that as well in a minute. The other way is, and I talked about this already, is being a valued member and a contributing member of the community. So making sure that they're getting out, they're meeting people, um, they have an opportunity to work. They have an opportunity to volunteer. And, you know, all of this I'm saying is with the caveat of, I know we're experiencing a pandemic and those opportunities are limited, but they will be available again in the future. We need to acknowledge what we really like and admire about our sons and daughters and introduce them as such. You know, it is... Often we're introduced with paper, or our children are, and it's, you know, high behavior, aggressive behavior, nonverbal, autistic, and, and this whole list and barrage of things that can be challenges for that person. But we forget their humanity when we introduce them. And so we want to make sure that agencies know that my son or daughter is compassionate, they're friendly, they're fun, they're funny, they have a great smile, they're stylish. So we want to bring their humanity to the present. Because if not, this is the reputations that they get. She's so spoiled, he's so aggressive, has attention seeking behavior. I'm sure a lot of you have seen some of these things written about your son or daughter. And that's the main focus when it might be a very small percentage of the time. And we want to make sure that they're seen as human beings. And that's really what person-centered services are about. And these are reputations that we can change by enhancing what people really like and admire about our son and daughter and talking about it in front of them. Um, they see a lot of negative stuff. So what is your vision for supported living for your son or daughter? And what is their vision for supported living? Equally as important, if not more important, because our children have dreams about what they want to do, whether it's in a year or it's in an hour. A lot of people live in the present moment and they're not always thinking about five years from now, which is always asked at the IPP. Well, where do you see your child in a year? Where do you see your child in five years? Like, I don't know. I'm just trying to get through today. How many of you feel that way? I know sometimes I do. So we want to see what is the vision for our son and daughter. And this is a tool that you can use. And it's called the life domain vision. And there's one for your individual and there's one for your family perspective. And it looks at every area of life. So you're kind of stimulating your thinking, you're stimulating conversation about what you want to have happen so that when your child's in supported living, you have some outcomes and some goals that should be one of the things that the supported living staff is providing. Training. Okay, this is a big issue for supported living staff. Um, if you go to Craigslist, you will see a lot of job opportunities to work with people with developmental disabilities. A lot of it is for supported living agencies. And it may say, you know, train, you know, experience desired, but will train. Who's going to do the training? Other people who don't know your child as well as you. So there are some things that we can do to help make sure that the staff know who 
your son or daughter is and know how to support them in a way that actually works and doesn't yield increased behaviors to make their point or to communicate. I really don't like this. I don't like it when you play that music in my house and I have the right to ask you to please turn it down or put your headphones on or whatever. So we as family members have to start communicating to people who serve our son or daughter in any capacity, how to support them, what's important to them, and how to combine the important two and important four to be beneficial in supporting your child. We need to build trust. And so, you know, one of the things that is hard for us as families is to, you know, really give up the, I hate to use the word control or knowledge of how to interact with your son or daughter. Give that up to somebody who is just meeting your son or daughter for the first time. So what can we do? We can start putting that information together. Um, got some recommendations for how to do that too. So I'm gonna skip this one for the sake of time, but if you Google empathy and Brene Brown, B-R-E-N-E, -E, Brown and empathy, this is going to be a very meaningful video in supporting your son or daughter or any other human being. You know, person-centered services are not about people with disabilities, they're about human beings. So what can you do? You can put together a one-page description. The one-page description is going to tell people what others like and admire about them, what's important to them, and what supports should be provided and how. They should be very detailed. And here's an example. And there's one of these in here for you that you, in the handout, you will be able to fill out for your son or daughter with based on the knowledge that you have about them. And I'll show that to you in a couple of minutes and show you how that works. Here's my daughter's one page description. She has given me permission to share this at trainings. And note the information under best supports. Bolded are some of the most important pieces. Give me advance warning and prep for change. Let me know how much time I have. She might need like snooze, you know, I push the snooze button once or twice. Um, we can become their snooze button if that's what they need to change activities. Five minutes, okay, I'm gonna set a timer for you. And then when she's upset, that's the worst time to threaten consequences for someone because that is just gonna escalate it. So I tell them, do not threaten consequences when she's upset. You might just get hit, <laughs> okay? Um, and then all this other information that how would anyone else know that? Don't whisper to her. She feels like it's being yelled at. And that's because of history. You know, people come with history. Sometimes it's traumatic and the trauma of whispering was because when we'd go into a place where she needed to be quiet or sit still, we'd whisper it to her. So she always, and still 37 years of age, equates it with being yelled at, okay? How would anyone know not to whisper to her? They say we're supposed to let go. This is gonna be on my tombstone. I have insight. I know the history. I'm going to continue to contribute my thoughts in how to support her in a good way because I've got 37 years of experience. I've learned how not to get hit. I've learned how to motivate her. But if I hire somebody off Craigslist, 
I better be ready to help them understand who she is. And if I've got an agency that isn't interested in providing person-centered supports, even though it's required, then I need to look at what other alternatives might exist. And so there are a lot of really good agencies. And sometimes you get one that's kind of not going to work for you. And then you might work with your service coordinator and then um, go on to the next agency. So you have a to-do list, and this is in the handout that I sent you, and then I'm gonna get right to your questions. The first thing, get supported living in the IPP. Then when your child gets closer to the time where you want them to pursue or they wanna pursue not living with you, um, go to a supported living orientation at your local regional center. IHSS must be explored if you're pursuing supportive living services. Start thinking about staff that might be able to work with your son or daughter. If you have a team of people who know and care about your child and you know, you've trained them well, you can ask the agency to hire them and, and to be their staff. And then you know, start building that one page description that's really going to help that person get to know your son or daughter for who they are and how they need to be supported and what's wonderful about them.